Philosophy in the modern period has often sought to define itself against its major other, religion. Religion is allegedly the domain of mystery and faith and dogma, where philosophy, allegedly, understands itself as the domain of clarity and reason and free thought. It's this focus on the supremacy of reason alone that has often struck me as suspect. Of course, many of the greatest philosophers have been religious, from Al-Ghazali to Thomas Aquinas. But I've long since sensed that philosophy has only a kind of armistice with the non-rational. Philosophy has always struck me as having some other side, another story, an esoteric dimension that it can't quite admit to itself, but is there. Philosophy has a kind of shadow, to invoke a little Jung. In this episode, I want to explore the shadow cast by rationalism itself. In the intellectual crisis of the 17th century, a philosophical program would emerge that sought to unify mathematics, logic, and philosophy into a grand synthesis that would act as a foundation for the emerging new science. And it would be René Descartes that would most profoundly develop this new synthesis that we would now call rationalism. And I want to explore how a mystical experience, a series of dreams had by Descartes himself, might just be behind the crown jewel of the Enlightenment we call rationalism. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. To understand just how important the work of Descartes was, we have to put him in his historical context, and that context is perhaps the greatest intellectual crisis in human history. For centuries, over a millennium, the world, from Baghdad to London, had rested on two fundamental pillars of truth. The one being revealed scripture, either in the form of the Christian Bible or the Quran, and the other, of course, being the physics of Aristotle. The vision of a geocentric universe composed of four elements, tending toward their natural place, shaped by four causes, all surrounded by great crystal spheres into which the very fixed stars are mounted into the floor of heaven went fundamentally unchecked through the legalization of Christianity, the rise of Islam, the Crusades, and the great plagues of Europe. Then, cracks began to appear. In 1610, Galileo made his first observations of the moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus. What had been a mathematical solution to a problem of epicycles proposed by Copernicus was more or less empirically confirmed in the publication of the Sidereus Nuncius on March 13, 1610. This is in some sense the birth date of all of modernity. The problem becomes clear. If Aristotle were wrong about something so fundamental as this, what else might he be wrong about? Increasingly, the world did not seem to observe the laws set forward in his famous book, The Physics. This precipitated something of a vast intellectual crisis. Thinking, knowing, or even proving Aristotelian physics wrong doesn't mean that one arrives at a much better, much less correct position, especially as one as totalizing as Aristotle's. So by the mid 17th century, there's a crisis emerging. It's becoming clear that the Aristotelian science is failing, but there's no new science in the wings to sort of fill the gap. The very structure of the world, once completely understood using an Aristotelian framework, was now beginning to completely break down and there was nothing to catch it. By the middle of the 17th century, intellectuals knew that there was a severe problem in their basic understanding of reality. But worse, they had to also come to the realization that incredibly smart people had held a fundamentally wrong theory about reality for centuries. This crisis set forward a twofold agenda. The first part, of course, what is the fundamentally correct theory of how reality works? And two, how do we develop a theory in such a way that this kind of problem, this kind of situation where hundreds of people over millennia have held a fundamentally wrong view, how do we develop a method of gaining knowledge so that that never happens again, so that it is internally correcting? It's into that context that we must put René Descartes, the inventor of analytic geometry, and who's rightly taken to be the founder of philosophical modernity with the publication of his 1651 Meditations on First Philosophy. In that work, the Meditations of 1641 are truly groundbreaking for a few reasons. One, it introduces the idea of methodical doubt, that we arrive at the truth not by accepting authority, 
but rather we doubt our way to the truth. Second, it introduces the concept of analytical clarity and distinctness. That is to say, a criterion by which we may evaluate whether an idea is worthy of being held. Further, Descartes rejects solipsism, the idea that we can only know that we exist. He introduces the mind-body distinction, which goes on to become the problem of the relationship between the mind and body in modernity. And he is the founder of a new school of philosophy that we typically now refer to as rationalism. Although I have to admit, there's still something about analytical geometry that gives me nightmares. There's something about the combination of uh, finding the slope of a line uh, in combination of the idea that I was doing that in the most awkward time of my life, middle school, uh, that fills me with more horror than anything that could be dreamt up by someone like H.P. Lovecraft. So uh, analytic geometry still gives me the willies, but that doesn't make Descartes any less important. At any rate, you can certainly think of Descartes' project as something like cleaning out a closet. Well, what's the best method for cleaning out a closet? So you take everything out and you sort it into three piles, right? There is the uh, trash pile, there is the keep pile, there is the donate to charity pile, there's the maybe I'll fit into this one day, but probably not pile. So if you sub out what's in my closet, which is a lot of detached starch collars and black metal t-shirts, and substitute in for that clear and distinct ideas, you see what you get to keep. That is to say, you take out all of the ideas, you find out which ideas are clear and distinct, and then those ideas are placed back into the mind to become the foundation for all other ideas. For Descartes, the way that you vet these ideas is by subjecting them to an analysis along the lines of mathematics and logic. Those ideas that stand the test are allowed to stay and become the foundations for further ideas, and those ideas that do not meet that challenge are cast into the rubbish bin of the mind. And it was upon that foundation, the foundation of clear and distinct rational ideas vetted by logic and mathematics that Descartes wanted to build as the foundations for the what is being called at this time the new science, as opposed to the old science that is the failed science of Aristotle. And remember, this project wasn't just about finding the foundations for a new science, but it was also about finding a method by which we wouldn't get science wrong ever again. There wouldn't be a new science to the new science. That method had to make sure that bad ideas couldn't get in. So it had a dual mechanism here. On the one hand, we know that the foundations for the new science would be solid, and we also know that they could never fall victim to the same kinds of mistakes that we'd experience with the old Aristotelian science. And I think we have to at some level admit that this project worked. If we rewind the clock to 300 years before Descartes, people were actually walking through the streets of cities, flagellating themselves and in the hopes of alleviating the plague that was ravaging Europe in order to act as a repentance to God. And if we zoom 300 years after Descartes, well, people are walking around on the moon. I'm not saying that science as it stands now is perfect by any means. Certainly there are still fundamental problems to be worked out. And I think it's very important that scientists and philosophers be humble about what they get right and be honest about what they don't yet know. But we have to admit that the Cartesian project really set the agenda for one of the boldest shifts in human intellectual power, something that Thomas Kuhn, I think, would identify as a prototypical example of what he called a paradigm shift. So how did Descartes come upon this new rational foundationalist philosophy? Of course, the answer we expect is, well, he arrived at this system through rational deduction of simpler and simpler principles that were vetted through logic and mathematics. And if you were to believe that, you'd be wrong. No, it wasn't through rational deduction. It was through mystical dreams. Yeah, mystical dreams. If we can say that Descartes developed the foundations of modern science and philosophy, we might also say that the foundations for those foundations were nothing other than mystical insight, a kind of gnosis. So yes, behind the foundations of modern science and philosophical rationalism are a series of three dreams that Descartes had on the night of November 10th through 11th, 1619. So what do we know about these three dreams? The only surviving account comes from a very early biography of Descartes done by Bayer and published in 1691. This, uh, the account of the dreams, by the way, is in volume one, pages 81 through 86, if you want to check that out. I'll have a link in the description where you can actually look at the original transcript of the dreams and Descartes' analysis and Bayer's analysis as well. Sadly, Descartes' own version of the dreams and his analysis have actually vanished. Uh, he composed them in a text called the Olympica, 
Uh, we know that they were still available to be looked at in the time of Leibniz. Leibniz actually looked over the text uh, himself. They've long since gone missing. Scholars, however, do think that the Bayet text is very closely, if not literally taken from the Cartesian text, the Olympica. So I think we can trust, and I think many scholars agree, that we can actually trust uh, Bayet's analysis and accounting of the dreams themselves. So it's here that we turn to the early biography of Descartes by Bayet. So in about the week building up to the dreams, uh, Bayet accounts that Descartes was experiencing a kind of building up sense of what uh, Descartes and Bayet both called enthusiasm. Now, enthusiasm is the name of an early modern affect. It doesn't really exist. It's a sort of an emotion that uh, sort of went extinct, which is interesting. Um, but this idea of enthusiasm was marked by an overwhelming sense of inspiration and sometimes resulted in ecstatic outbursts. Of course, the word actually has a Greek origin. It literally means something like to have the being of a god inside you, and it was typically associated with spiritual possession by the god Apollo. So for several days prior to the night of the dreams, Descartes recounts having this mounting sense of enthusiasm. And again, enthusiasm doesn't just mean to be excited about something in the early modern period. It's as if something were possessing him. And it's not uncommon, by the way, at this time to use the word enthusiasm to actually describe something like spirit possession. In many cases of the witch trials, enthusiasm was a marked uh, symptom of being possessed. And this was also a term used to describe uh, political fanatics. Uh, so this term enthusiasm had a very mixed kind of tenor in the early modern period. And the fact that Descartes admits to being filled with enthusiasm would actually look relatively negative to many of his contemporaries. So on the day of the dreams themselves, this enthusiasm had reached a kind of uh, breaking point, And Descartes admits that he, quote, discovered the foundations of a wonderful science uh, before going to bed. Now, we don't know what this wonderful science was. It could be that he's discovered the foundations for analytical geometry. And it could actually be that he has already inside him the seeds for the new philosophy that he will eventually develop in, in books like the Regulae, the Discoursal Method, the Meditations, and the Principles much later. So at any rate, Descartes, filled with enthusiasm and having discovered this wonderful new science, actually gets ready to go to bed. And it seems as if he knows that he's going to be visited in the night by some kind of breakthrough in his dreams. Uh, Bayet actually writes that, quote, he, meaning Descartes, adds that the genius which has excited in him the enthusiasm with which he has felt his brain heated since some time before, had foretold these dreams to him before he went to bed, and human intelligence had played no part in it. That last line, that human intelligence had played no part in it, again speaks to the fact that Descartes thought that a kind of supernatural event was about to happen to him as he went to bed that night in November. He'd already had this mounting enthusiasm, he had made this enormous breakthrough, and he had the deep sense that he was about to be visited by something other than human intelligence in this dream. And again, what's interesting here, Bayet feels the need to apologize for Descartes in some sense. He doesn't want the reader to believe that Descartes is completely off his rocker in this situation. In his main line of defense is that we can trust Descartes, despite all this enthusiasm, hadn't had any wine in months. Now, I don't know which one is more unbelievable that Descartes had a series of dreams in which supernatural beings talked to him and revealed to him the fundamental truth of reality, or that a French person can go months without drinking wine. So in the famous heated room, Descartes went to bed on the night of the 10th and had a series of mystical dreams that fundamentally laid the foundations for modernity. Like all dreams, they are very hard to summarize and they're even more difficult to analyze. I'm gonna include in the description below a link to a couple of articles that actually uh, include the entire description of the dreams by Bayet, but also engage in further analysis of the dreams themselves. So if you're interested in psychoanalysis or if you're interested in dream analysis, uh, make sure to check out those links in the description below to actually read the entire dream sequence by Descartes, including Descartes' own analysis of his dreams and Bayet's own analysis of the dreams as well. So those are in the description below. But to summarize, Descartes in the first dream finds himself surrounded by ghosts and buffeted by a whirlwind into a church. And there a uh, measure in who he knows 
uh, actually gives him a melon from what Descartes thinks is a foreign land. Uh, Descartes also finds himself bent over in a really uncomfortable way and unable to stand up straight. Uh, he then prays to God to relieve him of the evil that is uh, sort of uh, saturating this dream. And then he awakes, apparently he meditates for an hour, and then he falls back to sleep. In the second dream, uh, Descartes uh, awakes the sound of an enormous sound, like a thunderclap in his room. And when he opens his eyes, he sees that the rooms are filled with uh, sparks, sort of uh, uh, glistening in his room. He then employs philosophy in the form of, I suppose, rational analysis uh, to calm himself after this incredibly startling thunderclap sound, and again, he falls back to sleep. In the third and most complicated dream, Descartes finds himself in a room with a table. On that table are two books, a dictionary and a collection of miscellaneous poetry. He opens up the book of poetry and uh, immediately notices there is another man in the room. Uh, Descartes will later identify this man as the, quote, spirit of truth. The poem that catches his eye in this collection of poetry uh, begins, quod vitae sectapor iter, or uh, from the Latin, uh, which way should I go in life? Uh, again, this is not surprising considering that Descartes is part of this huge intellectual crisis, and he's been spending months and months and months trying to solve this crisis for himself. So it's not surprising that the book he would open up to would literally be a poem asking, which way should I go in my life? So after leafing through the book and noticing some really elaborate copper place designs, both the book and the man, the spirit of truth, both disappear. And Descartes, and this is very strange, inside the dream, Descartes begins to actually interpret the dream itself. This is like some inception stuff. When Descartes awakes from the third dream, he actually begins to uh, further investigate the dream. And apparently this third dream was so vivid that Descartes had to actually wonder whether or not he was really seeing it. He wonders whether or not he's dealing with a vision or a dream. And he does eventually come to the conclusion that it was in fact a dream. But again, it shows you some sense of how absolutely vivid this was, or to use Descartes' own terminology, how clear and distinct this was. He wasn't fundamentally sure whether or not it was a vision or a dream, and it was only outside of the dream that he was able to analyze it sufficiently to realize that it was in fact a dream. Descartes' own analysis reveals that the dictionary represents science, the book of poetry represents the union of wisdom and philosophy, and that the sparks from the second dream reside in the mind uh, as a kind of divine inspiration. Uh, these are possibly the innate ideas of God placed there by God that are actually used to prove the existence of God in the 1641 Third Meditation. And, of course, the idea of divine sparks should, for folks who already have some background in esotericism, this should immediately ring as a common trope in mysticism. Of course, there's no substitution for actually just reading the account of the dreams for yourself. My summary here is just a summary, and any summary of dreams is actually going to be woefully inadequate. So again, I would highly recommend that you go read the dreams themselves, especially if you're interested in things like dream analysis. And further, I'm not a psychoanalyst, and so I'm not going to try to analyze these dreams from a psychoanalytic point of view. But I am someone very interested in Descartes and interested in Descartes' career as a philosopher. And what seems to happen for many of the images in the dreams is that these get recycled over and over and over again in Descartes' later works, which tells me that Descartes was definitely and significantly impacted by these dreams, so much so that they left a kind of impression on his psyche, and that impression gets worked out over and over and over again in his later philosophical works. So just to give a few examples. One of the examples of this image of him in the first dream being surrounded by ghosts on the street. That exact image reappears in the meditations where Descartes is actually looking out uh, onto a, uh, a square and he asks himself, uh, how do I know that these uh, people down below aren't just ghosts wearing coats and hats? That's in the Latin edition. In the French edition, he actually wonders whether or not the people down below are in fact automata, or kind of primitive robots. So again, this image of the ghosts on the street reappears. And further, this image of the whirlwind or whirlpool also reappears in the meditations as well. At the beginning of the second meditation, Descartes finds himself in a whirlpool of doubt. 
So this image of being uh, trapped inside of a whirlpool or a whirlwind seems to be very apt for the feeling Descartes was experiencing here around 1619 when he's now very ardently looking for the foundation for the new science. I think also further is the impending sense of overwhelming evil to be found in the first dream that again to me sounds very much like the idea of the evil genius when that's the exact same phrase used in the first dream and in the first meditation uh, to describe a kind of overwhelmingly powerful malevolent force that can fundamentally deceive you about everything, especially deceive you about the truth of logic and mathematics. So the appearance here of kind of an evil force in the first dream, I think gets mirrored again later in Descartes' work. To keep going down this rabbit hole, What's also interesting is that the text Descartes is reading inside the dream, which is interesting itself. I don't myself know that I've ever been able to read inside of a dream. And I'm not even sure that one can read inside of a dream. But uh, at any rate, Descartes claims that he did. And the poem that he's looking at is actually by a Latin writer named Ausonius. And what's important about all of these poems is that Ausonius claims that all of the ones that Descartes mentions are all meant to be quote unquote Pythagorean poems. Now, as you know, and as I've actually made another video about, Pythagoras before the modern period was especially associated with mysticism, numerology, and Kabbalah. In fact, in 1517, the writer Reuchlin actually said that Pythagoreanism and Kabbalah were the exact same thing. So this certainly gives the dreams a kind of esoteric angle if we put them into the context of Descartes writing there in the early part of the 17th century. The fact that the dreams would be of a Pythagorean nature would again reinforce the idea that what's going on here is something somehow mystical or supernatural. And lastly, I think what stands out to me is that Descartes finds these dreams to be so vivid that he can't tell the difference between them and reality at some level. And that exact same trope reappears in the meditations where Descartes actually wonders, right? Uh, how do I know I'm really sitting in this chair warming myself by a fire? Again, when I could in fact be in a dream and when I'm inside of a dream, I don't know that I'm in a dream. And for me, it's incredibly telling that this is precisely a dream in which Descartes can't tell whether he's dreaming or having a vision. And that business where Descartes can't tell the difference is exactly the idea that's gonna get played out in the first meditation as a way for him to doubt his way to the truth. Because of course, in dreams, we experience all kinds of incorrect things. And we know that dreams, at least in this sense, aren't real. And therefore we can doubt all kinds of things in reality. And it's in this dream, this dream that Descartes can't tell between it being a dream or a vision. And this is where Descartes comes into contact with what he calls the spirit of truth. This seems to be a kind of semi-divine, divine or angelic character inside the dream that seems to be girding Descartes on to the process of unlocking the secrets of reality. And of course, all this has to be held under the understanding that Descartes' own version of this text he entitles Olympica, further linking his own visions with a kind of divine revelation. Of course, Olympus being the home of the Greek gods. And none of this should be terribly surprising. Dreams have long been thought to be a conduit through which divine or mystical insights are revealed. From the vision of the sleeping Jacob to the sleeping prophet Edward Casey, dreams are said to be 1 60th of prophecy according to the Talmud. And it must be noted that the Greek philosopher Iamblichus spoke very favorably of the process of what is called incubation, where one, in order to answer a spiritual or philosophical question, actually goes to sleep inside of the temple of a god in order for that god to visit you. And again, the phrase enthusiasm here comes to mind where that god will actually visit you in your dreams and provide you the answer to the philosophical or spiritual question you're confounded about. And even the skeptic Sigmund Freud believed that the dreams of philosophers were dreams from above, that they were uh, trauma von oben, that they were dreams from somewhere on high. So the idea that Descartes would go to bed full of enthusiasm, expecting a kind of mystical revelation and then receive that revelation from a historical religious point of view be totally unsurprising. What's surprising is that we now write back onto history of Descartes being the founder of rationalism and we simply ignore this entire dream business. Now, if all of that weren't enough, if the foundations of rationalism and the new science weren't built in some sense on a series of mystical dreams, 
the situation actually gets a little bit more esoteric. In the midst of this intellectual crisis, Descartes is sort of looking everywhere to find an answer for how to settle the new science and provide unshakable foundations as a mechanism of getting the truth. And one of the crucial things that we know Descartes is reading at this time are books of Raymond Lull and the author of the three books on occult philosophy, none other than the model for Faust himself, Cornelius Agrippa. And not only that, we also know that while Descartes was living in Germany in the 1619 period, he was actively seeking out members of none other than the Rosicrucian fraternity. He admits that he wasn't able to find any members of the Rosicrucian fraternity when he was actively searching for them in 1619, but he does make the acquaintance of a certain Johann Fallhaber, who published a series of what I would call Rosicrucian adjacent texts. So not only was Descartes actively reading people from the Western esoteric tradition, he was actively seeking out members of the Rosicrucian society precisely in order to help him solve this intellectual crisis. So Descartes wasn't necessarily looking for purely logical, purely deductive ways of solving this crisis. And by 1619, he was really open to a wide range of possibilities about how he might begin the process of solving this intellectual crisis. And further, it shouldn't be surprising when you spend your time reading people like Raymond Lull and Cornelius Agrippa in actively steeping yourself in Rosicrucian manifestos that one might go to bed full of enthusiasm and have, well, the spirit of truth revealed to you the fundamental nature of reality. And indeed, it's difficult not to see at least something of a connection between Descartes' sort of driving obsession with the idea of clear and distinct ideas with many of the Rosicrucian texts that one can find at this time. For instance, there is a Rosicrucian text of 1619 published the exact same year of the dreams called the Raptus Philosophicus, in which it employs something like a language of clarity and distinctness in its title. And of course, we also can remember from the famous Confessio, the principal text of the Rosicrucian Manifestos, that it actually aims to reveal its truths in, quote, a simple, easy, and naked form, as opposed to the obscure and difficult ideas to be found in texts adjacent to it. So again, when I see Descartes' interest in clear and distinct ideas, not only do I see in him a philosopher and a scientist interested in being completely able to analyze reality reliably, I also see something of this Rosicrucian language penetrating into his philosophy early on. And it's not just my idea here either. When Descartes returned to Paris in 1623, several years after the dreams, he was accused of nothing other than being a Rosicrucian. Now, I don't know of any compelling evidence definitively leaking the Rosicrucians with Descartes, but even as late as Leibniz, when Leibniz was looking over many of Descartes' papers, even Leibniz still viewed Descartes as somewhat suspect. I think, in fact, even Leibniz calls him a positive enthusiast at this time. So there's even the idea as late as Leibniz that Descartes had become somehow infected, one might say, with esoteric Rosicrucian mystical beliefs. It's interesting that Leibniz was concerned about this, but if you take an intro to modern philosophy class or even an intro to philosophy class, you'll likely hear about Descartes, you'll likely read some Descartes, but it is very unlikely that you'll have any discussion at all about this whole business of the dreams, the Rosicrucians, etc. At any rate, after the experience of the dreams, uh, Descartes immediately writes them down for publication in the Olympica. Uh, he doesn't publish them, unfortunately for us, uh, but he does vow to go immediately on pilgrimage uh, in order to further reveal this mystical knowledge. Now, he does put off that pilgrimage, and I don't actually know if he ever went on the complete pilgrimage at all. But again, notice that what Descartes is taking to be going on here is a kind of deep spiritual transformation as much as it is a intellectual or rational transformation. In the months and years that follow, Descartes will effectively write and rewrite the exact same ideas in new books over and over and over again, something like a man obsessed. So you'll find the same kind of ideas in texts as early as the Regulae, You'll see them developed further in the Discourse on Method. They'll be developed further still into the Meditations, and they're very highly developed by the publication of the Principles. And not just this, but even toward the end of Descartes' unfortunately short life, he's already begun to try to geometrically analyze his own ideas. That is to say, 
put his ideas into a purely geometric form. And of course, that is going to set up both methodologically and philosophically his greatest inheritor, at least in my opinion, the philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Over the course of Descartes' life, he increasingly tried to efface these dreams. He downplayed them and downplayed them. And even in the Discourseal Method, where he sort of talks about his own bio intellectual biography, he completely fails to mention the dreams there at all. It's as if he's become self-conscious of this business, or he's ashamed of them at some level. But I think if we look at the totality of his life's work, and if we look at the trajectory of his intellectual development, there's simply no way of denying that these dreams, both in their phenomenological impact upon him, but also in their spiritual and rational transformation, led to the very nucleus of his philosophy and scientific breakthroughs, and therefore to the very foundations of modernity itself. As I said earlier, the foundations for modernity may be rationalism, but the foundations for rationalism appear to be mysticism, and modernity would do well to come to terms with that. So as we can see, rationalism itself has a very kind of murky origin, uh, soaked up to some degree with Rosicrucianism and mystical dreams and the works of Cornelius Agrippa and Raymond Lull. I mean, in that crucible, modernity is formed, although we're only often told half of that story. Here, rationalism sits right beside occultism, dreams sit right beside mathematics, and they are all in some sense united almost by a supernatural force in the life of Descartes. Now, you might be asking why you've never heard of this whole dream business before, and I was interested about this myself. So interested that I wanted to write my entire final seminar paper on Descartes on this subject, and guess what? I was told not to. It's as if, and this again is my own analysis, this unrational, this mystical side of modernity is actively being repressed. And if we know anything about repression from Freud, we know that the repressed always returns, and it never returns in a way that we can predict, and it never returns in a way we want it to. And I think this might be a classic example of what Walter Hanegraaff, the great scholar of Western esotericism, might call rejected knowledge. That we have a story about how modernity developed and how rationalism developed, but modernity itself can't make sense of it, and it does the only thing that it can. It represses it. And I'd like to think, a little bit at least, that this channel is a return of that repressed, at least in a small way. This exploration of the esoteric side of Descartes is part of a series here at Esoterica where we explore hermetic and occult aspects of canonical philosophy. So stay tuned. We'll spend a lot of time exploring philosophy's shadow, to go back to that Jungian idea, throughout the course of this channel, whether it's through canonical figures like Descartes, a relatively obscure figures that we'll be looking at through the course of exploring philosophical ideas here at Esoterica. So make sure to subscribe and consider supporting Esoterica on Patreon or via a one-time donation. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.